Uh, thank you, Dean, for that uh, very over, overly generous introduction. Uh, my dad's in the crowd <clears throat> to catch the program today, and I'm sure he was looking around trying to figure out who he was talking about. So, um, Well, uh, the Arkansas Energy Office uh, is very pleased to partner with the Clint School to bring you this program here today. Um, before we get started, I just want to take a minute to thank the Dean, thank Nikolai to Pippa, um, and the entire staff of the Clinton School for all the work that goes into putting on an event like this. Um, this uh, the Clinton School Speaker Series really is a tremendous asset and resource for the students, for Central Arkansas, and for the entire state. Uh, the, as you can see with the posters around you, the quantity and quality of speakers that uh, the school attracts on a routine basis is just phenomenal and the fact that anybody from the public can RSVP and come and have access to these uh, uh, great ex experts in a variety of fields and, and uh, uh, big time newsmakers is, is just really uh, unique and uh, unheard of. So thank, we thank them for their work and uh, for the service they provide the state. We've got a great uh, panel here today to talk about uh, solar energy. They're all very active in the industry in, in various ways. Um, before we, we get into that, um, I would like to take a moment to brag on a program that has been administered um, by our office uh, for the last couple of years. It's our Renewable Technology Rebate Fund. Um, as you can see right there, it was a uh, production-based incentive program um, to encourage small-scale wind and solar developments throughout the state. Um, you can see a map there of the various locations that went in. Uh, we had a total of 843 kilowatts of capacity installed, 124 installations. Um, all but three of those installations were solar. Um, so it, very impressive uh, uh, with that. Um, it's important to note that, um, that while relatively small, uh, compared to some other states like California and uh, New Jersey where they enjoy quite a bit of incentives. Um, the 843 kilowatts of capacity and those, those installations occurred in just under two years. When you compare that to the, the, the installations that occurred in the state from the last decade, from 2001, that, that were under net metering, that's a 400 percent increase. So while relatively small, it's been a, a, a huge growth for the state and, and, and very great. Um, and, and just to put in perspective, the estimated annual energy production from those installations is the equivalent to uh, the amount of energy consumed by uh, 108 Arkansas homes. Here's a picture of uh, one that was installed through the program um, down here, down the street at Heifer International, 24 kilowatt system. You can take a walk and uh, see, see their magnificent building and take a look at that. I understand eventually they're going to allow bring uh, some of their animals over from Perryville and let, allow them to graze around there when they get the, the grass growing well. Um, here's a, a residential facility up in northwest Arkansas, uh, Winslow. Uh, you can see the solar panels there um, in, on the left, um, the ones that convert sunlight directly to electricity. Um, you can also see a different looking panel there to the right, and that uh, uh, captures the heat from the sun to for actually use for domestic hot water needs. So uh, they are utilizing as much as they can from the sun, so we appreciate that um, also through our program. So with that, um, we've got a great program. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists, uh, then I'll ask them a couple questions. Um, we'll keep it pretty informal, and they can, uh, if I uh, direct the question to one of them and another panelist would like to put in, they're more than welcome to do so. After a few cycles of doing that, then we'll kick out some questions from the audience like normal. So um, with that, I'll start with uh, Mr. John Smirnow. John is the Vice President of Trade and Competitiveness for the Solar Energy Industry Association. John leads CIA's advocacy and support of open and fair markets and growing the U.S. solar supply chain and manufacturing base. John also oversees CIA's environment, health, and safety initiatives. In his capacity, John provides trade policy advice to the U.S. Trade Representative, Administrator of the U.S. EPA, and the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. He's also served as a legal advisor for the Chairman of the U.S. International Trade Commission and law clerk to the Honorable R. Kenton Musgrave of the U.S. Court of International Trade. John received his Master of Law degree uh, in International and Comparative Law from Georgetown University Law School, and uh, his Juris Doctorate degree from the Thomas M. Cooley Law School, and his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Michigan. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Joe Thomas. Uh, Joe is the uh, uh, CEO of Mage Solar, uh, president and CEO. He became so in the winter of 2010 with a wealth of highly 
successful manufacturing experience. Previously, he has managed a multi-million dollar international portfolio of high volume, large production manufacturing facilities. Mr. Thomas has a special knowledge and demonstrated capability in the management of existing and startup manufacturing facilities. Mr. Thomas manages $30 million investment at his corporate campus in Dublin, Georgia, and serving the entire Americas. This headquarters also houses a production facility for Magay's high performance solar PV modules and Magay's Solar Academy, a premium training arena offering a broad selection of classes for the PV industry and for professionals worldwide. And last but certainly not least, we have Arkansas's very own Douglas Hutchings. Uh, Douglas is an entrepreneur uh, working to commercialize a breakthrough technology to reduce the manufacturing costs of silicon-based solar cells that was developed at the University of Arkansas. Douglas founded Silicon Solar Solutions while he was pursuing his PhD at the U of A and raised seed funding while still a student. Uh, this is the most interesting part. Upon graduation, Douglas was able to hire himself as the third full-time employee. <laughs> Silicon Solar Solutions has gone on to operate in 16 international business launching competitions where they have won over $380,000 in cash and prizes, uh, which included an invitation to close the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in 2010. Douglas was recognized recently by Arkansas Business as one of the 20 in their 20s and as one of the five nation's top new inventors by Inventors Digest. So uh, thank you very much for, for all of you being here today to participate in this uh, panel. Um, why don't we just open it up? Why don't each of you give uh, a brief uh, introduction about your organization and their role in the solar industry and why you think that solar is so important to the future of the country? We can start with you, Joe. Good afternoon. Glad to see such a great crowd today. Uh, my name is Joe Thomas. I'm CEO and President of Magi Solar. We're a German-based company who came to the United States uh, a couple of years ago and set up our North American and, and South American headquarters in Georgia. And uh, we think solar is just tipping, just on the tip of the iceberg in the United States of what it can do. You know, I, I get a lot of questions and I was telling the group, a lot of people ask me, you know, so this is an emerging technology and it's not an emerging technology. It's a very mainstream technology around the world and in different pockets of the United States. But here in, in a lot of regions, it's something that's new. And, and it's something that it's just a matter of, from an educational standpoint, as we learn more, as we understand more, I think we'll find how the uses of solar really can really help and benefit us across the board, from, our, from energy independence to just everyday practical use. And we're glad to be here. We're a full system provider and a solution provider for all solar, uh, for what you need, especially from the residential, commercial, and industrial grade. And, uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here today, J.D. Thanks, Joe. Uh, again, John Smirnow, Solar Energy Industries Association. Um, I was uh, SIA's outside trade council for four years and um, of April of last year, so I've been there almost a year now. Became VP for trade and competitiveness. Uh, I got into the um, international trade field in law, law school. Uh, grew up just north of Detroit and um, really saw firsthand what international trade, the impact that it can have on U.S. companies, both uh, from a positive aspect as, as well as a negative. And so at that time, I, com I committed myself to developing a skill set to help U.S. companies compete and um, have, have really dedicated myself to that. Uh, what I like about solar is we're growing an industry. We're growing an American industry. And, uh, uh, you know, solar is global, so you, you know, a company like Mage has uh, ties to Europe. Um, they, they utilize the full global solar supply chain, but we're also going to build a, a very strong, healthy, full global solar supply chain in the United States. Everything from polysilicon to ingots to cells to, to PV modules. But the supply chain actually goes beyond that. Uh, it includes gravel. So if you have a big solar array and um, you don't want to have uh, sheep around the uh, the heifer field, you know, grazing on the grass, you'll, you'll lay down gravel to, to supply that. Um, so the, the, the company that makes gravel, there's an opportunity for them. Big solar array uh, has expensive equipment. Chain link fence manufacturers, there's an opportunity for chain link fence manufacturers. There's actually a first solar project out, out west that's going to use five miles of chain link fence. So chain link fence manufacturers are part of the sol solar supply chain. Pipe and tube manufacturers. I know there's a big pipe and tube manufacturing facility here in Arkansas. 
again, thinking of big uh, mound-grounded solar arrays, pipe and tube, uh, corrosion-resistant pipe and tube. So um, one of the things that we're trying to do is educate people that solar really is more than just uh, a really high, high technology. Certainly that's the heart of solar, that's what turns the photons in, into electricity, uh, but it's, it's con throughout the construction industry, um, green collar, blue collar, you hear all these, all these terms. At the end of the day, electricians, roofers, uh, forklift operators, so you have a big distribution warehouse out in Savannah bringing product in, solar related products, forklift operators are going to be working in, in that factory. So um, thank you for your time, and I look forward to having an open dialogue, open conversation, and we welcome any questions from the audience as, as we're going forward. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Douglas Hutchings with Silicon Solar Solutions. Uh, as J.D. mentioned, we're a local startup that spun out of the University of Arkansas. Uh, all the, the panels that you saw in the pictures, and the ones that are up right now, those are all silicon-based solar cells, and that is exactly the technology that we're, we're working to basically reduce the cost. Each one of those cells, uh, the primary cost in each one is the raw silicon material, and each one of those cells currently is using about 20 times more material than it needs to do. What we have developed is a process to make cells just thick enough to capture the light without wasting all the extra raw material. So we're very excited about the future of solar. Um, you know, we're working to bring the cost down. I think it's not a, a question of if the prices are going to get to the right point. I think it's a matter of when, and I think we're going to see some very exciting things over the next uh, eight to ten years. So what's really exciting to me as an entrepreneur is, you know, how do we position ourselves as an entrepreneur or as a state or as a nation to take full advantage of this fundamental shift that is occurring? Um, and we just need to make sure we're in the right place at the right time, or someone else will capitalize on it. So I look forward to our discussion here today. Thank you. <clears throat> Joe, let's start with you. Uh, let's start with some common critiques of solar energy. Uh, it's kind of a loaded question, so I apologize on the front end, but it kind of takes two things in. Uh, let's we'll start with the resource. You know, some say that outside of the southwest part of the, this country, there isn't an adequate resource to make solar economical um, as an energy source. Um, and the next point that is often heard about is because of its intermittent nature, um, it, the resource proves difficult for the utilities and grid operators to, to really uh, make a part of their their energy mix. So uh, if you could go into those two uh, topics. Be glad to. How many of you have ever been to Germany? Anybody? Anybody want to venture to give me a little impression of Germany of what you remember about the climate? Cloudy. Cloudy. Okay. Snow. Cold. Uh, rainy. How does that compare to the climate in Arkansas? Similar or the same? Different. Different. You get a little more sunshine here, right? Just so everybody understands the reason, the answer to the first question, the reason I started it off that way, is because Germany leads the world by far in the amount of solar installations in the gigawatts. And when I talk about gigawatts, a nuclear power plant produces about two gigawatts. So Germany has much more than that that's installed in, in power, and they mainly do it through distributed power. Distributed power means they do it at homes, businesses, or whatever it may be, uh, from a ground or roof mount. So the answer to the question of does it work here and is, it, uh, is Arkansas a great place or anywhere across the United States, if I had a grid and a graph and I could show you and compare, there's not a bad place in the United States anywhere. Actually, this is one of the targeted markets uh, because there's such an abundant amount of sunshine in comparison and the, use of, uh, and the use of that sunshine is something we've been given and blessed with that we can just convert that into power. So the, the, the answer to that is, J.D., is yes. It's a, it's a wonderful place, wonderful opportunity, and in comparative to the southwest, as you can see in the radiation grid that J.D. put up, you see a lot of orange out into the southwest, and uh, so that shows, when you look at this radiation grid, it shows sunlight hours and how much uh, it goes about, and the darker the color, the color, the better is from an orange or a yellow standpoint. The blue means it gets uh, less sunlight, so if you compare Germany to the United States, you can really see a huge difference and you can see the potential and the vast potential the United States has for the use of solar. The other thing that's a, a little misconception, everybody thinks the Southwest is so much better because of the orange. Well, actually, the properties and, uh, of solar, the way it works, you can actually get it too hot and get some degradation. 
You can get it too cold, but it takes an awful lot to get it too cold. It takes a lot to get it too hot. So the prime opportunity to use solar is actually in a, in a pretty pristine environment, actually a little bit cooler, and, and with good sunlight hours, actually even works to the optimal effect. And so an area such as Arkansas or, or most of the other parts of the country really is ideal. And there have been multiple studies done that shows, and actually there's one from Arizona State University that shows that Arkansas is one of the six best in potential for producing power from solar in the United States. And so, uh, so just tremendous opportunities there. And then as far as, J.D., as far as the instability on the grid, um, that is a question we get asked a lot. Uh, one thing to note is uh, the technology, when I said this earlier, it's an emerging market for us and an emerging something for most of us to kind of think about that we could produce our own power. Most of us are power users. We're not power producers. When you start using solar, you become a power producer for yourself or for if you're doing it for something else to add to the grid, you may do it for someone else as well. But the thing about it is all that technology already has built into it, such as a, there's a there's a piece of it called an inverter that automatically regulates the grid and automatically shuts down if, if, it, if it, it runs into anything or if for some reason a power line goes down or anything else. So the stability to the grid is already kind of inherently built into the systems. Now there is a, an up and down with the load that you can see on large scale applications, but for most usage that you find of solar and the most practical uses of it from distributed power, you would find that you're going to use it to try to offset your own power needs. And when you're offsetting your own power needs, that's very, I mean, the, the impact of that is very minimal. Plus, there's some technology called smart grids that, that, that is out now that actually helps monitor that as well. So that particular activity and the particular concern of that is very, very minimal, J.D. Well, thank you for, for that. <clears throat> John, uh, this next question is for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, what does it cost right now? I mean, that's the, that's the next question people will, will ask is, what is it going to cost me? Where are we in terms of grid parity? You know, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, well, one manufacturer claims that their thin film technology will be viable uh, at grid parity, parity in three to five years. And then <clears throat> a study came out recently um, in December that stated that the legitimized, le their levelized, legitimate cost of energy is competitive with fossil fuels now and then you'll read an article that says it's nowhere close to that so where are we really in terms of the cost on the consumer so the the cost question grid parity what is grid parity is is really a lot more complicated than i think uh, it's given credit for um, grid parity is a state specific issue it could be regional it could be within the state Grid parity is also, I think it's generally recognized as the price that uh, the consumer pays at the retail level. And if solar can get to that, then we're at grid parity. Well, if you consider that solar is producing during the peak hours of the day, um, when retail price, electricity retail prices are the highest, in many places within the United States, we're at grid parity today, today, and in a non-subsidized uh, environment. Now, there's a 30% federal tax credit, which helps, pulls, pulls that down, your cost of investment down. Um, but when you're, you're looking at pricing for electricity, you have the retail price, you have a commercial, industrial price, and then you have the wholesale price. Uh, at the retail level, you know, we were talking about this at lunch today, most places in the United States, when you're looking at those peak hours, we're already there, we're already at grid parity. Prices are coming down dramatically. Uh, especially for the equipment. We saw over the course of the last year, equipment prices fall 60, 70 percent in some instances. Uh, there are also a lot of developments in new technologies of, for other than the module balance of systems, microinverters, where you're actually taking the device that converts the DC electricity that's produced by the module to AC electricity. It has to be converted before it's fed into the grid. Um, generally, that's done on, in, the, in a residential sector on the side of your house. We now have technology where you're moving that device, you're shrinking it down to about the size of this, you're attaching it to a module, and you're making the module more efficient. A more efficient module then means that all of the other modules that are connected to that, or the solar array, uh, are also more efficient. So, you know, great improvements, lots of efficiency increases, making cells more efficient, uh, reducing the, the silicon costs. Um, you know, I think people, you see studies that th say three years, four years, five years. Three, four, five years ago, people would say that the prices today are going to be where they are today, three, five, 
six years down the road, and that's all been accelerated. So, um, you know, it really depends on what is grid parity and what is your definition of that. I think for me, the focus is retail first and foremost during peak hours. And when that's your measure, uh, in most of the United States, we're there today. Great. Uh, Douglas, <clears throat> we'll uh, shoot this one to you. Uh, uh, there, there have been some thin film firm technology uh, groups that have uh, been struggling uh, over the last couple of years, uh, some more famous than others, uh, due to what was really an anticipated drop in uh, the traditional solar technologies that uh, John just referenced. I mean, yeah, I think uh, Secretary Chu uh, the Department of Energy said there was uh, silicon process dropped 72 percent, or the price of those modules dropped 72 percent in a two-year time span. So, really, since you're working on this very type of technology, how does how do you adjust, and what's your strategy going forward? Yeah, that, I mean that's a great question. I think there was a lot of uh, different manufacturers that kind of, were kind of caught with their pants down, so to say, because they were shooting for a price per watt that was competitive uh, the day they started um, and the market just dropped right out uh, underneath them. I, I mean, I think if you go on affordablesolar.net uh, right now, you can see pallet prices for solar and I think they're around $1.15 a watt at the moment. Uh, the most famous case, Solyndra, I think was targeting around $3 a watt uh, in their very early days. And so, I mean, that's just a, an equation that doesn't work in the marketplace. I think. What it really highlights um, is the importance of technologies that don't try to recreate uh, the stuff that's already working today, uh, the technologies that just continue to push us along that line uh, towards grid parity everywhere at all times. Um, so you know, I'm very happy to say that's exactly the area that we're working in by augmenting uh, the, the cost savings that these manufacturers are already having. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of shakeout in the industry. Um, you know, I think margins are dropping very, very fast uh, because people are, are, are clamoring for market share. Um, the ones I think that come out on the other side are going to be healthier in the long run because of it. But I, I, I think it would be <clears throat> naive to think that this in industry isn't heading towards a commodity type business where solar is going to be won or lost, not on brand loyalty, um, you know, I don't care who makes my toaster. I just buy the cheapest toaster. Um, so, so I think the technologies that allow a manufacturer to keep going down that path have a whole lot of value, um, and there just so happens to be one of those right here in Arkansas. So, thank you for that. Uh, well, I'd like to ask this question or get your opinions on from all of you on this. At this next point is where do you you know in, in Arkansas we've seen a big drive to a more distributed. Um, type of solar activity on the customer side of the meter. Um, you were kind of alluded to them. I think the, the word that's been coined for uh, these people is prosumers because they're producing and consuming electricity in the same site. And so uh, where do you see, and, but obviously in southwest uh, part of the state and el elsewhere, uh, like New Jersey, there's more centralized power plants. Where do you see the future of solar? Is it more on the utility scale or are there more benefits to looking at it on a distributed level? Uh, J.D., I would say you're probably going to see some of all. You know, when you look at the deep markets that are currently across the world, it's almost become a mixture. Almost, a, I like to say, almost a 30-30-30. Uh, when you look across Europe, you're seeing, uh, you know, most of the market uh, there started off pretty exclusively with the residential got into the commercial, and now it's kind of revolved into the utility scale. In the U.S., you kind of had a mixture of it. You've, uh, uh, you've got different pockets and different places doing different things. But really, it, it's probably going to be a mixture. You know, it's what adds the greatest amount of jobs, what adds the greatest opportunity for us as individuals. I like to say we're in the land of the, uh, of the, of the brave and, uh, and the free, and what adds to us as far as our independence and our ability to contribute to our power needs and our opportunities is distributed power. No doubt about it. It's, it's the one that will help grow, grow the most jobs and the gross, most business opportunities for people and as well as help individuals the most. But then there's also the utility side to it as well to where utility companies can go into large what they call solar farms and create utility grid opportunities for, for large quantities of power. 
So it, it's a combination of it, but, but you also find there's been a huge market for industry on the commercial side where people are really realizing it can really reduce their, their um, operating cost. And that helps make them more competitive in the global landscape. You know, I've had the opportunity to sit down with multiple companies to where they were having to compete on a global marketplace. And if they could just get a little bit of the savings off of their current power bill, and they could actually turn that just a little bit of what solar could do for them, it made them much more competitive against their competition around the world and put them in the market, in the market realm. So it's, it's kind of like what John said. It's really how you evaluate the use of solar and how you need to use it to really return on investment. You know, if you were to go to Europe today and you talk to them about why they get into solar, they get into solar a lot of the reasons is because it's the right thing to do. They recognize it from an environmental standpoint, and that's very good. But here in the U.S. and in practical terms, what I tell people, you need to look at your return on investment. And if you really look at the ROI, as John said, and if you really look at when solar produces the most and what you can do for it and what you can do with it, it really, really pays off. And like you said, the grid parity is already there. But I think it's going to be a combination of markets. I think, I think as we get more educated as consumers, I think more individuals are going to find and want to do more and more with it because they're going to find that they can control that and can, and can get the independence themselves. Yeah, just, uh, just to add, I agree, you know, I think the, the three big uh, portions of the market, utility scale, commercial and residential, uh, we've, we've done studies. If, if you go to our website, uh, which is SIA.org, there's an executive summary of our quarterly solar market insight report. Uh, and it does a pretty good job of talking about solar, the growth in these different areas. And you'll see from those studies that the growth really is occurring in, in all three sectors. Uh, with respect to the residential sector, one reason you're seeing a lot of growth are new um, financial models, so leasing arrangements. So big, in, uh, big banks, city bank, investment banks are setting aside funds, solar-specific funds, to provide lease arrangements, no money down, uh, or you, you, if you're buying a system, you know, you buy, like buying, increasingly what we're seeing for residential is buying a system is like buying a car. You can lease it or you can have a four or five year payment. And I think once we get to the point where the cost of buying a system for your home is like buying a, a compact car uh, without any government subsidies or support or incentives, you know, that's when at the residential sector, I think you have kind of this kaboom moment where you know, it just really makes sense for everyone, assuming that you have uh, your roof is positioned the right way and you, you get enough sun for it to be viable. And I'll just chip in, you know, I think if you list out all the benefits associated with solar, one of the big ones is its on-site electricity generation. And so to me, the, the area that I'm particularly most excited about is the residential side where you don't have to worry necessarily as much about the distribution and transmission of power because it's generated right there on site. But I'm the first to admit there's definitely some challenges on the financing side of things uh, that John just alluded to. So kind of getting back to prices, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about renewable portfolio standards and feed-in tariffs uh, around the country. Uh, many fear that this is going to raise the price on consumers if, if these types of policies are enacted. Uh, you know, specifically, um, our energy, our more energy-intensive industries who have been um, good contributors to um, our, uh, a state's economy. So, you know, are those fears not legitimate? And, you know, there's been 29 states that have either enacted a, uh, an RPS goal or standard. So can any of you kind of talk about uh, the, the, the opportunities or some of the difficulties these states have faced? I'll take a first crack at it. Uh, the answer to the question is we all need to face reality in, in America. Every power source we've ever had has been incentivized. I'm not a big fan of incentives, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you'll hear me talk when, and, and my sales team and everybody else that we work with, and as we train people, we really focus on return on investment for people. Because as John was alluding to, if you look at when solar really, the usage of solar and how you can use solar, it really can pay off on your return on investment with very minimum uh, to almost no incentives, depending on the application and the situation, whether it be a homeowner, whether you be a business, or whatever the situation is. But when it comes down to incentives and when we look across the board, you know, there's a federal incentive currently in place for solar. 
which is great, and it really has helped the industry tremendously to kind of help individuals move forward with that, as well as companies. And as well as um, state by state, region by region, utility by utility, you run into different things. Usually what I try to tell people, let's, have a, let's just kind of have a look at, it, look at it from a fair standpoint. You know, here in Arkansas, you have a net metering policy that pays at retail rate, which is very good, which that basically means for what you earn, what you get. And so uh, that, that's really good, and that's a, that's a very good incentive in itself. As far as when you get into other more extreme incentives, you know, you've had places like New Jersey and California and other pockets of the country. You know, you take the New Jersey model where there was a tremendous amount of incentive thrown into the market, which created a huge threat market, which created basically a, a, a trade market. And that drove a lot of uh, solar activity across the market space. And then that, that got cut back. And then when it got cut back, and all of a sudden, it really slowed down the market. And it, and it created, I, I say it sometimes creates some falsification in the market to where people start moving in one direction. And the security of it is what everybody's looking for. So, you know, the incentives are good. You know, the incentives have been there for whether it be coal, nuclear, gas, whatever we've done, we've always incentivized it to some level. I think the levels that we need to incentivize solar is very minimal compared to some of the others that you find the other fuel sources that we're currently using. We must not forget solar is not our answer to all our energy needs. Solar, wind, or, or biomass, or any others, it takes a portfolio of coal, nuclear, solar, wind, biomass, all of it to really meet our energy needs because we're all big energy users. Until we get to the point as Douglas was saying a while ago, that we really grasp that we can really be producers of energies at point of use. And that's really what solar allows you to do. And you can do it quicker with solar than you can any other technology. And you don't have to wait years and years to create plants or anything else. You can actually have distributed power and generate it very quickly at a point. But, you know, does it help move the product along? Does it help move the industry along? Does it help us as consumers? Yes, it does. And the money that is spent for all of us from an incentive standpoint that does get thrown into the mix is very minimal compared to when you compare it on a broad scale to what we're doing across the board. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Um, you have to, when you think of the cost of solar, you have to think of the preferences, the subsidies that solar receives relative to uh, other forms of, uh, of energy generation. Uh, but one important point is that of all the forms of, of electricity, energy generation being discussed today, solar and wind are really the only two where we're actually talking about that uh, source generating electricity in a subsidy-free environment. Uh, and that's critically important. I don't hear any, for the other forms of, of electricity generation, people saying, well, you know, we, only, we need these subsidies only for a couple more years and then we'll, you know, we can keep doing what we're doing. Um, that's the conversation with solar. So we're moving within three, four, five years to a subsidy-free environment. That's the expectation, that's the demand. But to get there, you know, we need time. We're, we're, we're moving quickly, we're getting up on our feet. Other, another thing to remember, too, is that the U.S. Isn't the, only go, isn't the only country that really wants this industry, that really wants to grow a solar manufacturing base. And other governments are putting tremendous resources on the supply side to help grow those industries and lift up those industries. And so, in many ways, U.S. You know, solar companies in, in the United States uh, are competing not only with other companies, but also with other governments. So I think that's an important factor to recognize. Um, and I'll just throw in something from a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, we're ramping up to the point where we're considering solar manufacturing in Arkansas. And one thing I think an RPS signals um, is a vote of confidence and a vote of commitment to the industry. You know, <clears throat> venture capitalists, business in general, hates uncertainty. And so I think without a strong signal that, yes, this is an industry that we're interested in, and that we're committed to in some fashion. I don't know the details. I'll leave that up to people hopefully a lot smarter than myself. But there needs to be some form of commitment. Um, and I think that that can unleash a lot to come behind it. So. Great. Well, let's shift into some uh, recent activities that can uh, impact the economic development opportunities in the, <clears throat> in the near future, near and long term, really. And I'm definitely interested to get John's take on this uh, as this is, uh, directly relates to what he does and um, as well as the others because it, it will certainly impact them as well. Uh, recently, some uh, a few 
U.S.-based companies uh, brought a case to the U.S. Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission um, really asking to put uh, uh, tariffs on Chinese imports of uh, solar panels because they feel that uh, uh, they are being dumped into our market with uh, some uh, some unfair subsidies. Um, so, and we mentioned earlier, you know, there's been a dr- tremendous increase in, in installation in solar due to the, the dramatic drop in price. So, while this has hurt some of our um, uh, local manufacturers, um, it's been a boom for our local installers who, those are the jobs at the end of the day. They're service jobs that you can't export, and that I believe they represent a r- roughly 52 percent of, of the industry. So, you know, how do you how do you find that balance for our installers, and what opportunities might it present for the U.S. Um, in terms of depending on what the this uh, the decision is in in March, I believe. Well, I as, as I stated earlier, I, I believe that the U.S. needs not just one segment of the solar supply chain. That we, for the U.S. solar industry to be truly healthy, I think every aspect of that supply chain needs to be healthy, which includes manufacturing. Um, manufacturing, you know, and this, a lot of this comes from my roots growing up and uh, working in a small manufacturing facility where I used to work on a lathe, make uh, diamond cutting tools. A lot of innovation takes place on the factory floor. Uh, as you're, th- you're thinking of running your, your equipment, your modules through uh, an assembly line, you kind of actually have, the engineers have to see that process. And if you don't have manufacturing in the United States, I think you lose a lot of that in- innovation. The R&D, the U.S. right now, I think, is the leader in solar R&D innovation and then getting to pilot scale. But where where we're not doing um, all that well is going to to scale, commercial scale. Uh, And I think we really need to. I think we really need to focus on that, whether it's through tax credits uh, to help manufacturing, lower uh, corporate tax rates for U.S. manufacturing facilities. Uh, but again, in the international trade context, SIA and you know, we support open, free, fair markets. We support a rules-based global trading system. And that rules-based global trading system means that there are rules. And it means that parties have rights and parties have obligations. And in this case, the petitioners have every right under U.S. law and international trade law to bring the, this, their petition to ask the U.S. government to investigate this. The process that is, is going on at the U.S. government right now is transparent, uh, relatively, um, you know, I think fair. There, well, it is fair. A lot of people on both sides could, could take issue with that. Uh, but it's, it's there for a reason. So you have a right to bring a case. Conversely, parties have a right to defend themselves in that case. And one thing that C is working on, we're not involved in this specific case, uh, because even if we wanted to try to influence the case one way or the other, these are fact, fact-finding proceedings. Think of it as uh, litigation be- between two parties at, at a district court and the trade association trying to get involved in that litigation. There's really no role for a trade association to do that. So even if we wanted to get involved, we wouldn't really be able to move the needle one way or the other. But what we are working on is educating our members, educating uh, industry on the rules-based system. What does it mean for a company like Mage that is uh, operating the U.S. market, uh, importer, um, importing from China, importing from other countries? How will this case affect them? In addition, uh, we think it's really important that people recognize in a rules-based trading system, while litigation is critical, so the petitioners have every right to bring this case, negotiations are also a a critical part of the global trading system. So we're working collectively with other leading national solar trade associations, the European PV Association, the Chinese PV Association, the Japanese, the Taiwanese. And what what we're in the process of doing is creating a a global forum for dialogue to talk about trade issues. Because governments aren't doing that right now. It's just all about litigation. And because there's an important role for government in solar, to help us you know, lift up and, and, and get to, to grid parity, recognizing that there's an important role. The global trading rules are largely designed to get government out of industry. So here we have an industry where the rules, in some ways, kind of conflict with what's really healthy for the industry. And nobody's having that dialogue. What does that mean? You know, does solar, do renewables really fit into these global trading rules? And that's what we think is a critical dialogue to have. 
And so we're working with our governments at the uh, national level to try to create that dialogue, whether it's within the OECD, whether it's in, in the United Nations and the Rio Plus 20 events that are coming up, um, as well as uh, at APEC, which is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Uh, Asia Pacific region governments get together on a consensus basis and we're talking to the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, as well as MOFCOM, China's Ministry of Finance, to create a solar-specific dialogue there, to try to get ahead of some of these trade conflicts. Not trying to insert ourselves in any specific case, but getting industry government together to start talking about alternatives to litigation, alternatives to no-interest loans um, that you know, some of the governments are providing. And it's actually uh, created a pretty interesting market for technology companies such as ours. Obviously, there's a lot of downward pressure on prices, and so manufacturers are looking for technologies to either keep up or to pad their margins in some way. So I come from a little bit of a biased perspective, but you know, that creates an interesting marketplace for new technologies. Uh, John also made a very interesting point about you know, America is very good at innovation and R&D. Um, you know, in our particular case, uh, the professor at the University of Arkansas leveraged over about $10 million of funding from the National Science Foundation to get the technology to the proof of concept stage. We're now trying to move that from the proof of concept to manufacturing ready. Um, but it's really interesting, you know, if the support isn't there locally, the next logical step is, okay, well, you sell it to someone potentially overseas who's going to manufacture it, and then they're going to get all the innovation benefits from that point on and reap the majority of the, the financial benefit out of it. Um, so I think we see this a lot. It's not just in solar, um, but it is you know, an interesting thing uh, that we're living every single day. Uh, J.D., one comment I'd make on it is we need to look at ourselves. We're the consumers. Uh, as consumers, you know, they've been a policy in place in the United States where it's called ARA, Compliance Product. Uh, as a German-based company, we came to the U.S. and we set up operations, uh, of course, with our own distribution channels coming out of Europe, but also to be able to assemble product here to meet those requirements because of the American work, I mean, the American economy, we firmly believe will demand products from the U.S. But that has not been a huge impact to the economy so far. But, uh, you know, with what we see going on with, with trade conflicts and things between countries, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in private enterprise and greatly, and that the, and the market will demand and tell us what the market needs. And the situation is of, of what we've got going on now between countries, picking and winning losers and those type of things, that's not the way we can compete. The way we have to compete in the global landscape, I've set up manufacturing operations in Asia, in Latin America, and in the U.S. And when I came on board with MAGE, it was to help grow a U.S.-based business. And that's why I came back into the fold. Uh, to try to really grow those jobs here and under the premise that we, we all understand that. So, uh, so the thing about it is, is we have to look at ourselves as consumers and, and we have to decide, you know, do we truly value that? So when we start talking about developing U.S. manufacturing base, is it all completely centric, all U.S., or do we pull pieces and parts from around the world and on the global economy and we compete from that standpoint to try to give the consumer the best the best bang they can for the buck with the best quality we can provide them that, that, that is out there, that's really up to the consumers to decide. And I think as individuals, we'll, we'll see that in the long haul as to what we really, really embrace or what we don't embrace. Great. Well, thank you for all that. You've been great. Um, now, now comes the true test. Uh, uh, we'll take some uh, questions from the audience, so just raise your hand if you have anything. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, wait, wait for the mic if you don't mind. Uh, first, I want to express my appreciation to the Clinton School for hosting this, and these three fine experts and yourself have been wonderful in kind of giving us the broad stroke. I have two questions. One is a Moore's Law question, and the other is a thin film question. Moore's Law dictated the cost of computing over time. Every 18 months, computers double in speed or have in problems. And we've all enjoyed basically having desktop supercomputers before what Gordon Moore proposed 25 years ago. Is there an equivalent Moore's Law silicon, or is there an inherent difference because with Moore's Law you're printing smaller and smaller, and solar cells you're wanting to go thinner and thinner? So my first question is, what's the Moore's Law for solar energy? Sure, so I think, I think in the original form, it, uh, Moore's Law 
related more to the number of transistors that we could fit into a physical footprint on a semiconductor. Um, so the, it is slightly different in solar. I mean, it, solar is interesting because the, the value per square inch that you create is, is relatively low compared to integrated circuits. But I think if you, you know, there's a plot out there, I don't know who did it, maybe NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, that shows prices over time for solar come down roughly about 7% per year. Uh, do it. Your law, I have yep. a second question. Yep, basically. And my second question is with in-film technology, is the goal to go thinner and thinner or to eventually start sandwiching cells so that we can get different colors of the spectrum properly absorbed? Um, I mean, so I guess the there, there's trade-offs with every technology. I mean, I guess the end goal is to get a solar cell that's e efficient enough uh, that can be made at a low enough cost that it makes sense to install it on your roof. Um, you know, so multi-junction where you're trying to capture multiple different wavelengths of light are one way to do that, but that typically adds manufacturing complexity. Um, so waf wafer-based cells today are typically 200 microns, something like that thick. Uh, you only need about three microns of material to capture all the sunlight that you need. So if you get it down to three microns of material, um, you know, you've saved 197, um, and you can still capture all the necessarily necessary light. Um, so what we're working towards is about a 15% efficient thin film uh, using silicon, which is a very well-known material. Um, yeah. have one. And we thank North Little Rock Mayor Pat Hayes for being here today with us. Thank you very much, and uh, again, thanks to the Clinton School and, and Dean Rutherford for putting on these. They're just almost too voluminous uh, to be able to take advantage of as many of them as are out here, and certainly uh, this one is a, a high priority for all of us. Now, my question has to do with utilities. There are basically three general categories from uh, 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 municipal power uh, to IOUs to uh, co-ops in terms of the distribution, and obviously, yeah, there's going to have to be a parent uh, partnership in terms of, of moving this industry forward. How are you finding uh, the three different categories? I know we in North Little Rock are, are have the largest uh, public utility in Arkansas and are aggressively trying to pursue the kind of partnerships that address feed-in tariffs and, and uh, net metering and those kinds of things that would certainly be a, uh, a market uh, incentivizer for us to be a partner with the, uh, both the residential as well as the uh, commercial and industrial. So I guess my overall question is, how is the industry in terms of the partnerships that you need to have with those of us that are distributors uh, in terms of accepting and trying to uh, partner uh, with the solar industry? Uh, that varies greatly across the country, depending on where you're at and depending on which utility. Uh, one of the first things I always tell people is the high 90 percentile of this whole market is grid tied. So that means that you're tied together and it's a partnership between you and the utility. So you have to actually, you and the utility have to sit down and come to an agreement. Uh, you know, some utilities follow national trends. There are some of the bigger utilities and what they do. Other utilities and co-ops do their own thing. You know, we see variation in net metering policies. You know, some net metering policies pay wholesale rate. Some net metering policies pay retail rate, which is the standard that you find in most places. So it really greatly varies. And it also, the adoption of solar can really be dictated a lot by the utility. If the utility is really, uh, really wants to see something and really wants to take advantage of the distributed power that they can gain from that, then you'll find a much more open permitting can go much quicker. Everything about the process can go very rapidly. Other places, it can be a situation that where it's either an educational standpoint, maybe they just don't understand, or maybe they're just not there on their roadmap to looking at their portfolio of their power that they actually want to bring on solar into the mix. And when that's the case, it can be very difficult to try to get things to take place. So it really, really varies widely. You know, I, I can see it from county to county, city to city, region to region, to municipality to municipality. I see it. I see some municipalities that they can't get enough. I see some regions, some utilities that they want as much as they can get to start adding to their portfolio. And then I see some areas that don't want to touch it at all. And uh, the biggest hindrance that I tell people all the time with solar is usually education. 
it's really the myths that are out there about what will or what won't and how it does work and how it doesn't work and the cost of it and those type of things. Uh, it's really, you need to really do a good analysis and understand it, but it will always in most applications be a partnership. Where it will not be a partnership, and what I tell people all the time, I said solar and the utilities really should be a really good mesh, just because of all of us that, 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 that use power at home, if you're going to put it on your roof, you're going to put it on a ground mount or whatever you're going to do, and you're going to tie it to the grid, you're going to make that investment to actually to, to produce that power. That's not being made by the utility, but you're going to use those infrastructure and all the, all the lines and the wires and everything that they've done and they maintain so well. So you're going to use that in a combination. So it's a really good partnership that goes on there. Where it's not a partnership is whenever you go off grid. And the battery technology that continues to move forward, uh, one day that will be an option. It's an option today. It's just a more expensive option, a, a, a very costly option comparative-wise. But it will be, and it is continuing to be developed uh, rapidly to make that more of an option. But just to answer your question, it really varies. It really varies from who you talk to in each region. Bob? Just to, just to follow up quickly on that, um, oh. traditionally utilities have not been a part of, of the, our trade association. And we're uh, CIA's 1,100 members with a national solar trade association. There's another solar trade association called SEPA that represents primarily the utilities. And uh, recently we've been um, working hard to grow, grow uh, the industry's relationship with utilities. So I'm um, you know, optimistic that we're going to make, make progress. Uh, several utilities out there that are very engaged, very um, proactive, very excited about solar. So I think we're a lot of work to be done. Education is critical, but I, I think we're headed in the right direction. Just one quick follow-up observation, uh, and, and that is that, that, as you note, uh, Arkansas has really got a great advantage because of the cost of peaking power, and, and solar tracks that, uh, that, that line where the most benefit that we would receive is, is the time when our power would literally cost the most. And in terms of, uh, of our generation, one of the things that I've been uh, shared with me is that the more that we can levelize our load as a utility distributor, the better that we're going to be able to pass on better rates to our customers. You're exactly, you're exactly right. And uh, we see that uh, across the board. If you go do see market studies and market data, there are certain states that are a lot more active in solar that you'll get a lot of information on. But there's a lot of other states you know, across the country that you don't get in Arkansas is one, Georgia where our home, where our headquarters is is one, because they don't have an RPS, as you mentioned. Well, RPS is just means that there's a commitment. That means there was a verbal commitment. That doesn't mean there's an actual commitment sometimes. That's really what people are doing. So, but what we find is exactly what you said in the peaking, and as John said earlier, if you look at solar for what the real benefit of it is, it's really during those peaking times and for, for states like Arkansas, Georgia, the southeast, and across the country, it really pays off. And that's why we say grid parity is already here for those applications. The problem is for most of us, and, uh, and I'll just, I could just do it by a raise of hands, but I've done this in crowds before. How many of us know how many kilowatt hours we use per month? We're better than most here. How many of us know how much our electric bill is in dollars per month? You see the difference? And what he's describing is a huge difference. Is because most of us don't understand our energy use and our energy consumption. And once we understand that, that's when you start peeling back the onion and saying, wow, okay, this does make a little sense to me. But it needs to be used in the way that's practical that really returns an investment to you. And the thing about it is that's, that's the way to kind of position yourself, and, and I think that's what you're alluding to. Thank we you. got time for one more question back there. Yes. Could one of you speak just a little bit more about Solyndra, what went wrong, what lessons were learned, and how the industry can, can move forward from apparently the blinders that, that they had on? Yeah, so, so Solyndra, um, when their business model was put in place, um, silicon, which is the primary raw material that's used, uh, I, I guess, what, 90% of the panels that are sold today, the price of polysilicon was $400 a kilogram. And so their business model was built in that environment where their competing technology, crystalline silicon PV, uh, was relatively expensive. The current, roughly, the current market price for uh, polysilicon today is $30 a kilogram. So you went from 400, their model was built competing around poly at that time, now down to 30. 
Uh, so certainly that that was a, a, ma a major major driver, I think, to to what happened with uh, with Solyndra. I mean, you know, in many ways, there the Solyndra technology was very good on roofs that had uh, light weight, the sun could shine through, and um, you know they're used in uh, used in greenhouse applications. Just the timing was uh, for the model, the technology, uh, their cost of production was just too high. Well, uh, let's uh, let's give the panel a, a great round of applause. Here. And let's also thank J.D. Lowry and wish him a happy birthday today. Today is J.D.'s birthday. Thank you all for coming. You can visit with the panelists and J.D. We appreciate it.